not a shout. And you're in time you're live. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Hugh Douglas Smith. I run a, a web development company. Um, we do a lot of our development, in fact, virtually all of our development now on Joomla. And we focus on building websites for clients that have additional functionality um, and lots of custom extensions um, to give them the ability to put business processes online. What I'm going to talk about today is e-commerce and not get into the, the technical detail of that but talk about customer journeys and the reason why some e-commerce read a lot fail in terms of the number of visitors that you get in that start looking at products that start putting products into the the shopping cart <coughs> but then actually don't terminate that in an order and buy something at the end so to set the scene first of all let me just run through very briefly the the differences really between the online scenario a bricks and mortar shop and um, the, the the sort of online the, sorry the, the bricks and mortar retail side mm. so in online very easy for the visitor the user to be able to get a comparison of different prices different vendors different products the world is your oyster you can go wherever you like just at the the flick of a button it's accessible 24 7 you can access anything anywhere anytime there's no traveling to get there and um, and you can access many companies many products you don't have to limit yourself to to one particular store typically the perception is it's not always true but the perception is that if you're buying things online it's more likely to be in stock you can see instant stock um, on a lot of websites and whether products are available but products usually then are coming from a warehouse and they're likely to hold more than your bricks and mortar stock and it's very very convenient so that's why there's been this explosion in terms of the number of people buying online if you look at the the bricks and mortar scenario though in retail the real big benefit there is the touch and feel the trust you can turn up at the shop you can pick up the product you physically know that that is it that is the quality that you're getting you can carry it away with you there's no delivery times involved it's instant collection there's instant trust and that's really the thing that's lacking in the the online world so what I'm going to go through initially is talking about what makes a good uh, web experience what appeals to a large audience how you build trust using the quality of design quality of the imagery that you're presenting talking through sites being mobile friendly and why that's important having a straightforward payment journey so that having selected products you can actually put them in the cart and pay for them and then hopefully have them delivered have a clear value proposition get your customers to trust you get them to understand that actually if they do give you money you are going to to deliver and how you can put that online and how to guide them through the process how to have clear call to actions so that you're dictating to an extent where they go and you're funneling them through the website ultimately to that final payment page First of all, you need to understand who your audience is. Who are you trying to sell to? Because the methods that you use to develop a good customer journey are different depending on who the audience is going to be. So the typical questions you're going to ask is, am I selling to businesses in a B2B environment? Am I selling to consumers? There are differences in both approaches. And companies that try and do both quite often don't do it on the same website because the requirements of one conflict with the requirements of the other. If you're going out to consumers, what's the age range? What's the gender? If it's young people, they're likely buying and requiring different things than older people. 
Similarly, in the, the sort of male-female scenario, um, the color schemes that you use can change depending on who that target audience is. Where's the location? Is this a local service that you're offering, in which case you're containing everything down to a local geographic area, or is it regional or even international? Where are you able to supply your products? Where are you able to ship them? <coughs> What's the, the means of access for your audience? And this, again, is very variable depending on the sort of product that you're selling. In the, the business to consumer market, it's a high mobile, typically 50% 50, 50 plus looking at mobile access to a website. In B2B, business to business, it's less so because the people that are interacting with the website are typically sat behind a desk using a desktop computer. And if you're selling into the, the government, local authority, not-for-profit area, then the other thing that you have to contend with is quite often the browsers are going to be out of date. It's old hardware. It's Internet Explorer 6, 5. <laughs> um, security seems to go out the window, but it's, it's hardware that's there, it's been paid for, and nobody's going to pay to update it. The site needs to be visually appearing, uh, appealing, and it should reflect the brand of the, the company that you're representing. Don't try online to be somebody that you're not. If all, you're, all you have, effectively, as an organization is a market stall, then don't present yourself as the, the big, glossy department store. But equally, present yourself in the best way that you possibly can. You see the two little images here. Um, which would you rather buy from? The haphazard, I've just thrown all of my products on a trestle table and priced them up and I'm in the middle of the market, or I've actually taken some care to present things in an attractive way to try and bring people in, try and generate interest. Make sure that the, the images that you're using online are very clear at the right resolution and remember that they are replacing that touch and feel that you'd get in a physical shop. Um, Organise them on the, the site that they're easy to follow. It's easy to look through, find what you're looking for. Um, again, you see the, the examples here of the junk shop and the boutique. Which are you trying to emulate? Because one of them is very easy to navigate and find what you want. The other is just a random haphazard mess. Think about that when you're actually putting your category pages together and putting your product pages together. Also consider the size of images that you use. And this again depends on the, the products that you're selling. Two small images is bad. Having images too big is bad. And the where you need to be in the middle will depend on what it is that you're selling. Offer choices. Give the user, the visitor, the ability to be able to click through and get larger, more detailed images if they want to but don't force them into that position. Sorry, can I ask a question? Please. Uh, if you would go back to the image. Yes. You talk about too small, too big. Yes. How about the, the zoom in and uh, when you can zoom in to the product? So the, so the question is, on the website, having the ability to zoom into an image, you yeah. know, you sort of have a, a window that pops out to the side. It's great, it's a great technology, as long as you can make it mobile friendly. How, how you go about it is going to depend on your target audience. Um, but what I'm saying is, you need to get images online that are attractive, in the right size to suit your product, and have the option 
of having more detail for the user that requires them. Only, only thing that, uh, because I ask, because more and more shops are providing these images and consuming the product. And, and yes, yes they, they are. In very much details. And, and some of them work on mobile, and some of them absolutely don't. Mm -hmm. The key thing with a, a mobile environment, uh, sorry, an online environment, is you have got to develop trust. People are uneasy about dealing with a new name that they've never come across online um, before you've proven, yes, you can trust me to take your money, I will actually deliver the service or the goods afterwards. And trust is built over a number of interactions. There's typically five or six different touch points that you need to hit before somebody is willing to trust you. And you do that through the website by, if you're in the fortunate position, having a recognized brand, um, a large part of that trust is built already. But then having full contact details. If you're somebody that's unknown, making sure that easily accessible on the website is your address, your telephone number, your location. And if it's UK based, make sure that your telephone number is, non, um, is not a non-geographic. You know, it's great to put an 0800 number up because it's toll free, but the reality of it is anyone calling from a mobile has to pay for it. And it hides you from where you really are. So it's not a trust point. But if you put an 01 or an 02 number on your website, people instantly think, ah, okay, 01, that's that code, and it refers to this location. It's building trust. Incorporating reviews and testimonials are another way in an e-commerce environment of building trust. But make sure that you back those up with those being reflected into social media. There is a natural tendency not to believe the reviews that are on your own website because you're going to filter out all of the rubbish ones and you're only going to put on the best ones. The reviews on social media, you've got less editorial control over. So if you've got good social media reviews, link to those or pull them in onto your website. Build the trust. Provide access to staff for queries and support. Make it very obvious that if you have a problem either deciding what product that you want to buy or afterwards, there's help available. Make that contact accessible on the website. The obvious one that everyone's talked about for years with online uh, transactions is secure payment. Um, <coughs> I can't believe there are any sites out there now that don't use secure payment methods, um, but it's important that it's there. Be upfront, provide all the information about a transaction before you actually ask anyone to commit. The number of websites out there that hide the fact that by the time you get to the end of the checkout, there's a £10 delivery charge that has now made their price totally uncompetitive. I, I personally take the view now, if you don't tell me up front what the delivery charge is going to be, I can't afford it. I'll go somewhere else. Use an image and style that presents quality and presents your brand, your persona. Remember that trust is earned. It's a process, there are many touch points, and as you build that, as people navigate through the site, that's the way that you persuade them ultimately to transact. Use design and imagery and content um, which will appeal to your customers, entice them to go further and not drop out of the, the process. Images are absolutely key. 
When you go to a website for the first time, within two seconds, the average person forms an opinion. Is this site giving me what I need or has the potential to give me what I need? Am I going to wait for it to load? Am I going to click through and go any further? Um, you need to get that on screen above the fold so that you're not scrolling down to it. It's the instant view that you see when you first land on the, uh, the home page or the landing page. Give people the, the reason to actually drill down further. Provide differentiators. If you're in a competitive business, why is yours different? And by differentiators, I don't mean why is my product better than theirs. I mean, why do you as a customer, why would you with my product appreciate and benefit more from it than my competitor? So think in the eyes of the customer, what is it that your product service does for them as opposed to what it does for you if you sell it? The longer that you can keep somebody on the site, the more you're going to build trust. But that doesn't mean make it very slow to load. You've got to be mobile friendly. Even if you're in that not-for-profit government local authority arena selling services to them, you still need to be mobile friendly. If you're not, you've really got a challenge to a successful conversion ratio. <coughs> when you're testing the site on mobile, do test it. Does the basket work? Fundamental. There are hundreds of sites out there that I can call up on an iPhone and do you know what? The add to cart button is over there off the screen and I can't see it. I can't buy. The image for the product is off the screen. It's not responsive. It hasn't scaled. I can't see it. Or, and this is even worse, I manage to put products in the cart, in the basket, and I click the checkout button, and the checkout button doesn't give me the payment options because they're off the screen. So you have to test the whole process. Go through it on different mobiles, in portrait mode, in landscape mode. Go through, test everything, and most importantly, do a test transaction where you physically pay for an item. Because it's only by doing that Forget the PayPal sandboxes and everything else. Even when you've tested all of that, test the live site and make sure that the, the messages are coming back as you would expect them. Then think about the journey that somebody goes through and streamline it. You need to absolutely minimize the number of buttons to find the product, to click on it, and to buy it. Minimize the number of steps in the payout, in the checkout. Um, and absolutely cut down on the number of fields that are required to check out. There's been a lot of studies that have looked at how long do people stay on websites and the average is seven minutes if you're looking for a particular product and you're willing to buy it. And notionally, people have in their head, I'm willing to allocate seven minutes of my time to find the product and to purchase it. They have an expectation that two minutes of that is going to be checkout. If your checkout takes five minutes, you've lost them because they've spent five minutes finding what they want, researching the product and deciding this is what I'm going to buy, they'll get halfway through the checkout process, they hit the seven minute limit and they say, do you know what, I'll go somewhere else. It's going to be easier to go and spend another seven minutes with one of your competitors. Measure the drop-off rates. One of the things that's crucial to improving conversion rates on websites is knowing where the failures are. Google Analytics 
is absolutely your friend here, showing you all of the landing pages, the routes through your site in terms of the percentages of traffic that take these particular routes and then where they drop off. Analyze where visitors go, where they leave, and then use A-B testing to see how you can improve on that process. For those of you that are not familiar with A-B testing, basically what you do is set up alternate views of different pages on the site and then serve them 50-50, so the first person that arrives gets A, the second person that arrives gets B, then we're back to A, then back to B, and you do that over a period of time. Having assembled enough data, what you then do is say, right, in this instance, I've got a form here with a green call to action button and a red call to action button, and I find that actually 10% more people click on the green than the red. So what I now do is I change the red. I don't change the green because that was the best of the two. And I change this one to blue or I might change some wording and I run the test again. And I always make the change to the test which has performed least. And that way your conversion ratio should always be driving in an upward direction. Are you taking questions to go along with? I, I can, yes. Is there a Joomla tool that you know of that can help you with A B testing, do you know? Uh, good question. Um, Sorry. The way we normally do it is with a, a plugin. Oh. So we, we would write a plugin that will but it depends on you know, right, okay. is it part of a form? Is it part of a, a checkout process? Mm -hmm. Where is it that you want the test to come up? So you, you need to decide that, and then how do you go about it? Go about if, you're, if you're just serving pages, then I, I don't actually know what data you get. You, a B testing is really key in two areas. One of them is within something like the checkout process or in a form, measuring where the drop-off yes. is. Um, and the other is in Google's pay-per-click where you're bringing people to the site. So at that point then you'd be you're using two different, two different adverts, which one's most successful, yeah. and arranging it that way. Okay. Um, choose what you're offering. Um, and uh, when you're offering it. Joomla is brilliant with the, the way you can position modules around the screen, the way you can put them on different menu items. You can have modules repeated all over the place and they present little bits of content that are useful to the, the visitor. In an e-commerce scenario, the most common thing that people do is I'm in a shop, I'm going to put a module down the left hand side or down the right hand side that shows these are other products, these are the other <coughs> categories, this is other things that I want to entice you to buy. The challenge is that when you get into the checkout, the focus of the customer at that point is I just want to pay and get my product. I've done my browsing and the majority of websites, particularly the Joomla ones because it's really easy to do, don't turn off those other distractions in the checkout. And the net result is that I start checking out and I think, oh hang on, that looks interesting. And I click off and then I run out of my seven minutes and I'm gone. You've got an abandoned cart, you've lost the, the opportunity to make a sale. So yes, it's very valid to put in lots of enticements. You know, other people that bought this also bought that. You're looking at this, you might be interested in that. This comes with extra options. Always try and upsell, but do it when the customer is in the mode of browsing. Don't do it 
when you want them to be checking out. Make your calls to action very easy. Um, there's a, a big thing within all content management driven websites that you have your template and it comes with a standard set of buttons and you can make your calls to action totally consistent across the whole website. Then you install your e-commerce uh, engine and it has its own templating system, its own style of buttons and everything looks totally different and the user gets to the checkout and says, oh, where am I now? Um, so make it consistent across the entire customer journey. Guide the customer or the visitor where you want them to go. And there's very subtle approaches um, that I'm going to come into in a case study to show you that. Think of it, I, I personally absolutely hate the shop, um, <laughs> but think of your website like the IKEA store. IKEA has been absolutely brilliant in once you've got in the door, there is no way out until you have visited every product in the shop and you've been through the checkout, even if you're empty handed. You have to follow round, following this route, it's tortuous. What would happen in the event of a fire alarm, I have no idea. Um, but it's very valid in the web world. Think of how I IKEA works. How do they guide you and entice you to look at such a wide range of products, even though you only went in to buy a candle? <laughs> Be clear about all costs. Um, don't hide them because it'll be a point of drop off at the end and there's nothing worse than losing a customer when they've already filled their basket. Show taxes. Now this is interesting because in the UK we have VAT as, as the rest of Europe. Um, if you're in a business to business environment people want to see X VAT prices because they're claiming it back. Google from an SEO standpoint insists that you have VAT inclusive prices and consumers want VAT inclusive because that's what they're paying. So the only way around this is have an option at the top of your product pages, at the top of your category pages that allows you to flip the pricing across the site that turns VAT on or turns it off but make sure the default is on because from an SEO standpoint you're going to kill the site if you turn it off but you're now giving customers what they want. Explain delivery options and costs before you get to the checkout. Make sure that all costs are upfront. And if you're selling services, selling subscriptions, explain what the renewal process is, explain what the cancellation process is. When you get into the checkout, offer a guest checkout. Don't insist that you absolutely have to create an account before you can pay. When I go to the supermarket, they don't demand that they know my name and address and everything else and my inside leg measurement before I can actually pay. Make it fast, collect the bare minimum of data and work on the basis that this is the express lane. I have the products. I want to pay, I want to move on. If the customer finds they can trust you to do that, they will come back. And next time, they might be willing to register an account. Track abandoned carts. This is an interesting one because a lot of e-commerce um, extensions don't do this. Choose one that does. Um, find, track, where visitors are dropping off. If you're able to track abandoned carts, you can see what products they were interested in. Do you have a recommendation of an extension that does do that? No. no. I do not have any recommendations for e-commerce systems. <laughs> and, I, and I've used a lot of them. And each one of them all have their own idiosyncrasies and, and some of them are really good over here and not so good over there and vice versa. So the answer is 
you really have to choose the e-commerce package depending <coughs> on the, the client requirements. And quite often, it's a case, certainly we will work with two or three different ones, and we will say, no, for this client, we'll use X, for that one, we'll use Y. And we're very ready at the end of the day to say, it's not 100% fit to make it 95, 100% fit, we're gonna have to write some code and we're gonna have to modify it. Um, always, if you can, record abandoned carts. And if you've got the, if you've had a, a customer that's come back and they've abandoned a cart, follow it up. Send them an email, not less than an hour, and not more than 24 hours after the cart has been abandoned. And the content of the email says something like, Dear Fred Blogs, notice that you visited our site today, saw that you put some items in your basket, noticed you didn't check. Is there any way we could help you? Perhaps you'd like to phone this number. So you're not being aggressive to the customer, but you're seen as helping them. Well, excuse me, one of my clients, so they have the phone number, they actually phone the customer up. Yes. And they're, and they're a salesperson. Yes. So if money is an opportunity to recover a lost sale, it's an upsell opportunity. Yes. So part of the conversation is we saw your interest in X. Yes. Why didn't you buy it? Was it a problem with the website? Yeah. But we've got a special deal on Y. Sorry, for the benefit of the, the video then, yeah. I'm just going to explain that if you've got an abandoned cart like that where you've got a phone number, it's very valuable to actually be phoning the client, the potential customer, and saying, look, we've noticed you've done this. Was it a problem? Because you've then got the opportunity to, to upsell. Um, the other thing is, where people have um, dropped off, if you've got their contact details, um, then perhaps offer them a voucher to spend next time. Give them some incentive. Just be a little bit wary about that. I know from experience of one particular site that I use quite a lot as a customer that I know that if I abandon my cart at midnight that night, I'll get a voucher for an extra 10% off. <laughs> so guess what? I always abandon my cart. Um, you've got to decide from a, a marketing standpoint whether that sort of scenario is worthwhile or not. Um, know your customer. If they've taken the time to register, welcome them back. If you're tracking them for abandoned carts, um, then you've got the ability to go after them afterwards. One of the best examples of this in the online world is Amazon, and they've been doing it for years, and they are singularly very, very good at it. When Amazon first started, I went online and I bought one book from them. And a few weeks later, I went back to the site and they said, hello, Hugh, we noticed you bought this book. Would you like to post a review of it? Have you read it yet? Did you know that other people that bought that book also bought this? These perhaps you'd be interested in now. Now, in the town that I lived in, there was a bookshop, private little bookshop run by a husband and wife. And I typically go in there maybe once a month and typically would buy a book once a month. And I'd been doing that for years. And after 10 years of doing that, I don't think they even knew my name. I haven't been in them since. I would much prefer to deal with the impersonal world of Amazon because they know who I am, even though I've never met them. They are a great, their, their site looks horrible but they are a great example of the process and how to deal with people. Enticing them back, create an incentive program. After you've received an order, after somebody has checked out and you've delivered the product, go back to them. Have an automated email that will trigger one week, two weeks from a point of sale use targeted vouchers. Don't overdo it. Don't bombard them with emails every day. One a week later is probably about right. 
but you're engaging them, trying to entice them to, to come back as a customer next time. Avoid stupid mistakes, and I've seen websites do this. Build some intelligence into those uh, emails, those vouchers that are going out. The worst thing you can possibly do is 24 hours after a client has bought product X is to send them a 10% off product X. We've just reduced the price and we're not going to give you a refund. Um, so make sure there's some intelligence built into that. Personalize everything. Make sure you get it right. Looking at how they, the site looks, don't make pages too busy. Don't put so many options in, so many different products, that you totally confuse the user into not knowing where to go. Because what they will do is they'll exit and they'll go somewhere else. Deploy that strategy across the entire site. Be very, very consistent. Um, but recognize that different things work. A really bad example. This has become infamous around the web, partly because the guy behind it was on Dragon's Den, and partly because he seems to have made a name for having the most colorfully awful, uh, cluttered site um, that I just, I can't imagine anyone wanting to go and lease a car from this website. Sorry? She's a woman. She's a woman. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. <laughs> having said that, having put this presentation together, I went and did a, a company credit check on them last night. And actually, they seem to be doing very, very well. So, <laughs> so maybe, I'm, maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe people do uh, buy cars through this website. Source code on it, you'll see that it's very thoughtfully put together. I know it's a real insult to the yes. mind. Yes. A lot of this, um, most organizations won't pay for. It's an expensive exercise. But this is really interesting. Um, this is taking two websites and using eye tracking to see where visitors actually look at on the site and then comparing two separate products. So what you have on the left is a site selling bookcases and furniture and notice that the eye tracking is always on the pictures on the product. And here we have a site selling flat screen TVs and the eyes are always looking at the specifications and couldn't care less about the pictures. So in deciding how you format up your product pages, understand a bit about what the customer is going to be looking for. In other words, who's your audience? I'm going to run through a very quick case study. Um, we have a, a person that uh, works with us that's a real specialist in customer journey and customer experience. And she came up with Cadbury as a great example of how you can do e-commerce incredibly well. I started last weekend putting this presentation together and discovered that actually Cadbury have two websites in the UK. They've got cadbury.co.uk, which is their corporate website, that also sells chocolate. And they've got cadburysgiftsdirect.co.uk, which is a beautiful website that sells chocolate. Why they have two, I have no idea. Cadbury is an incredibly uh, well-known brand. So if I want to buy chocolate, I am likely to type in Cadbury or dairy milk or something like that, as opposed to typing in chocolate. So why they don't put their Rolls-Royce site on cadbury.co.uk, I just don't understand, uh, but they don't. And the difference between these two sites, although they both obviously spent huge sums of money on the design and implementation of them, 
are a world apart. If there's anyone in the room that had anything to do with either of these two websites, I apologise in advance. Mm. Um, so, let's take cabri.co.uk first of all. Last Saturday, I went to this website to try and grab some screens. And the first thing I was hit with was that at midnight on the Friday, their secure certificate had expired. So my browser wouldn't let me in until I trusted the website. When I did get in and I went to their product page, I was presented with this. Um, now, on most people's browsers, there's your fold line. So all I would have got is this brown chocolatey background and a load of very small text. And what you probably can't see here is a series of filters. And you scroll down, you now start to see products. But the problem here was all of these buttons, all the buy now buttons, are greyed out. So the products that I wanted to buy, I couldn't buy because this was their Easter products and they haven't started selling them yet. In contrast, this is Cadbury's Gifts Direct. It looks visually appealing. And it's just a model for how things can be done really, really well. If we look at the home page here, take the fold line as being about here on the, the average screen. I've got um, this carousel running that's telling me or trying to entice me into to shopping now, presenting nice images. It's got a gift finder. I can scroll down and start to see products and services. It's just beautifully put together. If we jump back to the Cadbury's page, this is their home page when they finally, this was from yesterday, um, so there's been a few changes and they have renewed their secure certificate. Unfortunately, what they've actually done is served the entire site minus the images over that secure connection. So the first thing that the browser does is takes the padlock and puts a little yellow exclamation mark over it to say there's a problem with security on this site and when you drill into it you get the um, the reason for that so the idea even though it's Cadbury and you know it's a well-known brand and it, it's trusted they've got this problem that they're not going to trust people to actually give them any money and then you look this is the entire depth of the home page this is the sort of area that you get above the fold and it really doesn't tell me that I can use this site to buy chocolate. It's not doing a great job at all. Um, the product page, I'm, gonna, I'm just being hurried up now, so let's go through this very quickly. Product page on the left is the entire page, hundreds of products, most of which have grayed out buy buttons, so you can't see them. Um, there we go, I decided to go for mini eggs, and guess what? no buy button. I get a lovely picture of the, the product, but no information about it. In contrast, I come here and I've got the products, the help down the, the left. Um, it's just enticing me to want to buy. If you look at what's here, if you think of a normal <coughs> website having their sort of full um, home about their first line of navigation at the top what they've done here is no we want you to buy we're all about buying here so our navigation the top level navigation is the full range the Easter products the gift ideas product range make your own the brands they're trying to get you in to make you buy they offer this quick filter on the left and um, the help info is stacked on the left so that you can instantly see any other information that you need to trust them to, um, to get there. They've used iconography to great effect in this site. Um, if you're stuck, you need help, you want the delivery information, it's all there. They've been very consistent about their calls to actions. 
So they use a large button to add to the basket. They use a small button for info. So it's subconsciously driving you towards um, that, uh, that button. I'm going to go through this very quickly because I'm obviously overrunning time. Um, lots of search capabilities that change as you start to put things into your basket. You get into the basket. This is the other key thing. In the basket, when you want people to check out, give them a checkout button at the top and at the bottom. Um, four steps going through the, the checkout. This is, if, if, it, if there's a weakness in this website, it's here. Um, there's perhaps too many steps going through this because the delivery details it, it gives you two in one and then calls it one. Order summary, payment, and look, they're offering lots of payment options. It's all up front. They're telling me everything is secure. Um, another great example, ASOS, again, very well laid out. All of the information is there. So some final considerations. Um, be very consistent in terms of the, the colors that you're using throughout the site. Um, colors will send different emotions to people. Make sure that you're using things that are consistent with your brand. Be very aware that different colors mean different things to different genders. So if you're aimed selling dresses or shoes to Ladies, <coughs> pick colours that are appropriate to them rather than the, the strong colours for gents. Um, colours on action buttons, <coughs> pick those that are actually going to entice your audience to come through. Um, avoid pop-ups uh, that are not requested, so make sure there's an action before they happen. Um, proactive chat is a great way of helping people but make sure that there is actually chat available um, and it's manned. <laughs> Unnecessary registration, just streamline it, get it right down. Uh, don't have too many fields or steps. Use postcode lookup. Um, there's a couple of great sites there, getaddress.io, postcodes.io, um, that will help you do address lookup. Don't ask for the credit card type get it from the, the number and um, default to the most the, the least expensive shipping method make the the journey easy be upfront about charges use uh, iconography I'm, I'm skipping through this now because we're massively over time be very careful about the tone of voice that you use to the customer um, don't use buy use an add to basket it's much softer it's not as direct um, don't be over personal at the beginning you can personalize at the end um, just one quick thing and this was stolen from a, a magenta site which is great if you've got a customer that has come back for a second time but they've not registered the first time you will already know their email address so when they get to the screen in the checkout about identifying themselves and they put the email address in offer them the ability to email me a new password. They've never had one. But if you email them a password and they now log in, you've already got all of their details filled out for them. Last few words, um, always put the customer first. Measure, test, use A-B testing, and the best of luck. <laughs>